Okay, welcome to our class tonight. This is uh, class <clears throat> class number 23 in our Known of God series of classes. To begin, uh, I want to go back to our first set of verses that we began considering at the uh, onset of the classes. Because I think if we keep these verses in mind during this class, it will it will tie these things together nicely. Uh, verse 4, this is Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through verse 9. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And I'm going to read it as it should be here in verse 6. And the the... The seal, yeah, that's it. The seal of your sonship is that God has sent forth the spirit of his son in your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And notice this adoption, and this was the thing that threw the Jews. This was the thing that they could not understand, and one of the reasons they rejected him was that when he came offering them the adoption that was promised to them, as Paul says in Romans. He presented that adoption as himself. He did not present it as something he would give to them separate from himself. That's important as we go in back into the chapters in Numbers that we've been looking at in chapter 16, 17. Um, I think my phone... <laughs> But it's very important that we keep this in mind as we as we look at these verses because we have to understand the singleness of this. And the adoption is defined in the singleness of one son, not many sons adopted into a family. That's not what adoption's about. It's about the one son given to every soul as the gift of grace. We've talked about in the number 16 that, that this relationship that is, that, is the, that is called Israel, this relationship this, that God has with this people is a relationship of grace, governed by the grace of God. It's governed by the grace of God that is always governed by the cross. And that is the thing that was an offense to Korah and his company. And that's the thing they stood against because Moses and Aaron represent that very relationship that they alone stood as, as God's relation to the whole. And we're going to see this for, uh, more and more reiterated through these, through these uh, uh, verses that we're going to look at tonight. But let's, let's go back to Galatians 4. And... The seal that you are sons or the evidence that you are sons, having the adoption now, is that God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, bringing into your soul a relationship you could not have or could not attain except that son be in you as that relationship. Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And you have to understand again, this inheritance that he's talking about in chapter 3, that for, here and in the first verses of, of chapter 4, all have to do with the promise made unto the seed. One seed. Not seeds as of many, not a corporate company of people, but the seed himself, one, who is Christ. Not the Christ company, <laughs> but Christ, the single one seed in his, let's say it this way, the seed who is the possessor of all fullness. It's not like the single grain that was planted. No, it's now the one seed who stands before the, for, for the Father, flourishing, fruitful, the fruitful branch, the fruitful vine. And we're going to look at that tonight with Aaron's rod. This is 
the inheritance and everything is, is, is secured in the seed. It is determined by the seed because it is unto the seed that all the promise was made. And the, and the question is only, are you born again of that seed or are you not? As long as you are ignorant of the true nature of this inheritance, being that it is given to the seed who is Christ, and if you be Christ, then that seed is in you, and then you are heirs according or in accordance to the promise. As long as you are ignorant of that reality, you live as a servant, just like uh, chapter, chapter 4 verse 1 says. And you still remain under tutors and governors, types and shadows, things that point to, but you're still, even if, the, even if the substance itself may dwell in you, if you're ignorant of that substance, you still need types and figures and you still try to apply the types and figures to that which falls short of the substance. Howbeit then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them, which by nature are no gods, but now, after you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. And this is, again, we need to keep these verses in mind. This spirit of adoption, this son in us crying, Abba, Father, and that being the nature of God's knowing of us. That being the reality of God's knowing of us. The Son in us crying out, Abba, Father. That single and all sufficient one given to the soul as the gift of the grace of God crying out in our hearts that that to me this this story of Korah and, and what we're about to look at tonight has made that more and more profound and more and more uh, weighty a matter so we we left in the last class we were talking about and it's, it hasn't been my intention to stay on Korah and this situation uh, so long but as my current view of, of this is and my current view of Christ is I've tried to cover it as well as, as possible but there's some things I want to, to uh, reiterate as we proceed into chapter 17 and we're going to go to chapter 18 uh, a little so in the last class, maybe the last two classes, we dealt with the absolute and utter end that came upon Korah and his company. We looked at that as the judgment that is made manifestly apparent in the appearing of God's glory. They were simultaneous. The glory of God appeared and then the destruction of Korah and his company. The revealing of his knowledge, his chosen one, his holy one. When God makes manifestly known the one he has called, chosen, and caused to come near unto himself. Everything that is by nature a contradiction to the reality of Christ is removed, is seen to be removed, is seen to be no longer of the congregation of Israel, having no place, no part of the congregation that is Israel. And Israel is my son. You see that in the, in, the, in the revealing of him who is the chosen one, the holy one, the knowledge of God personified, you see everything else removed that is contrary, contradictory, and in opposition to that reality. Those who had, those who in this in this destruction, those who remained, or those who uh, remained alive, or those who had separated themselves unto Aaron, those who had come out from the wicked ones and separated themselves unto Aaron. But we'll see as we go on that they had to understand the reality of this death. They had to understand the death that would bring about the purity 
of their relation to God. An understanding that had to come into their midst concerning the cross. Concerning the grace that had been given to them of God. And we'll look at that as we, as we go. I, I pulled up some commentaries about the destruction. And, and I didn't read those in the last class. So I wanted to put, uh, get those in these classes. I just think they're significant in the way that in the language that's used here. This is from the Bible knowledge commentary of the Old Testament. It says that the earth came together again. This is when they were swallowed up in the earth. The earth then came together again, concealing the evidence that they had ever existed. I thought that was very significant. Josephus says about this. Uh, happening he says those who so entirely perished that there was not the least appearance that any man had ever been seen there now you have to understand this is the reality of the cross being made manifest in the in, in this congregation this is the reality of the putting away of one and one remaining the taking away and the establishing of of what God perceives, the knowing and the knowledge and the eternal reality perceived of God, known of God. The earth that had opened itself about them, closing again, becoming entire as it was before, insomuch that such as saw it afterward did not perceive that any such thing had happened. You see how positive how utter this was that now that they're gone there's no evidence they even existed that takes you back to one of the translations we read that they vanished from the congregation of Israel as if they never existed why because if you're contrary to the seed when you stand in opposition to the grace that God has given you in the seed himself you don't exist you're either known in that one of God or you are not known. You either stand clothed upon with that one found in him having nothing of your own or you are not found. And this is a realization that is brought into the midst of the congregation. This is a lengthy one from Josephus as well but he goes on here and says uh, and this was so entirely, so entire that their very bodies left no remains behind them. Aaron alone was preserved. And not at all hurt by the fire. See that? They were gone. No remaining evidence they existed. And Aaron alone was preserved. Because it was... God that sent the fire to burn or to destroy those only who ought to be burned. <laughs> and Aaron was now no longer esteemed to have the priesthood by the favor of Moses, by the, <clears throat> but by the public judgment of God. And thus he and his children peaceably enjoyed the honor of priesthood afterward. The judgment declared his supremacy. Do you see that? The judgment declared his supremacy. That's what has to happen in the heart. Where one is preserved, one remains. That judgment coming into our hearts, declaring in our hearts the supremacy of the one seed that remains. The one seed who has the only right to stand in the sight of God and to offer to him anything. I wrote here, I want us to understand the utter singleness of this view. God's view of the congregation, God's knowledge is now being revealed and there we see the absolute simplicity of God's relation with the whole. Aaron alone was preserved. Because the fire came upon all that should be burned. All that was opposing the exclusivity of the knowledge of God. This singleness only comes in the revealing of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And when the simplicity is made known, nothing else has a place. 
You understand that's what Paul talked about, that you would not be beguiled as was Eve from the simplicity that is in Christ. That word is singleness. The singleness. See, most are beguiled, most are deceived because we have added to the singleness of God's understanding, God's view, God's, God's eternal knowing. We've attempted to add to the equation. We've, we've attempted to bring ourselves into this picture. And as we see here, God will not permit it. This grace, this relationship into which we have been brought, or that has been brought into us, will not permit such additions. Only one lives. One remains. Then we spoke about the memorial after their destruction that Moses had made out of the censers of those who had died Now, I like the way Josephus says it. He says it this way. Hereupon Moses, after these men were destroyed, he was desirous that the memory of this judgment might be delivered down to posterity, that the future ages might be acquainted with such judgment, that they may be acquainted with the judgment that took place. You see, see this seems to be the need and the reality that's addressed here. And I know it's the need and the re realization that is necessary in my heart. That's why I like that it's a memorial. It's a continual thing. It's something that stands there forever for them to... The word memorial actually means a mark. Something set up to be recognized or attended to. Something to be observed. And God set this there so that everyone who came from that moment on would be acquainted with the judgment that had taken place. And that's why I say the judgment that we see in the face of the glory of God himself is not a one-time thing. It is a continual memorial, a continual working of the judgment, working in our heart, severing our soul from what God has cut off and put away. What has ceased from the congregation of the Son himself. It's my soul ever being acquainted with the judgment of Christ. I've already spoken about how that this relationship that God had set in the midst of the people was governed by grace, which is always governed by the cross. So this is a picture of what I believe it means to grow in grace, to by faith access the grace in which we stand, or to know even as we are known of God. This, you'll see it here and in, in the next situation that comes up immediately afterward and then in chapter 17. You see this happening. It's God reiterating his point, making his point. And I'm saying that is what happens in the heart. God continually making the point, one and one alone lives. Not I but Christ and that reality, which is the reality the moment we're born again, being continually wrought in the heart so that it becomes the government of our soul. Not I but him. That it becomes the thing that is always overshadowing everything. Every thought, every word, every understanding would be governed by this reality. Not I, but Christ. And that would be the thing that governs my, con my understanding of my relationship with God. Not I, but Christ. And that's, to me, what's going on in these, in these verses. Numbers, um, let, let's read these verses. Numbers 16, 35 through 40. <clears throat> well, I'm just going to read this one here. This is uh, him telling uh, Eleazar, the, the son of Aaron, the priest... 
He said to take up the censers and to scatter the fire with the incense. What, we, what he was to do is to take it outside of the camp and get rid of that fire. Get rid of the incense that they offered because it was a polluted thing. It was pollution in the sight of God. And this is exactly the thing. And again, I know I'm reiterating these things, but this is exactly what we offer every time it's us attempting to offer something to God. Every time we're attempting to stand before him with our censer in our hand to be recognized of him as something acceptable to him. It is pollution. It is merely my illusion of what it means to be close to God. And we're going to talk about that too. And it's abhorrent to God. And we'll get to this, but Numbers chapter 18, 22 in the Young's Literal says this way. And the sons of Aaron come no more near unto the tent of meeting to bear sin, to die. What that means is, in the literal it's saying this. In a lot of translations, it's almost as if it could be a possibility or not. But what he's saying is, anyone but you, Aaron, anyone but your seed, if, if anyone other than you comes before me to offer anything to me, the only thing they ever offer to me or can possibly offer to me is their sin and their pollution and their corruptness. All, that word means all of those things. And they die. That's the only thing they can offer. There's only one who offers to God what is acceptable. Only one who can offer to God and is unto God what is well pleasing. Only one who is in the sight of God and in who is before God that fragrance. The perfume as some translations would say that delights him. And only that seed can offer it. The glorious reality of the grace of God is that that seed is our life. That seed lives in us. So he says that this will be a memorial unto the children of Israel that no stranger, listen to the word, no stranger which is not of the seed of Aaron Come near to offer incense before the Lord. See how he defines stranger? Other translations say an unauthorized person. Anyone unauthorized. How does he define it? Not the seed. Not the seed. Not seeds. He's not picking out seeds. He has one seed. That will stand before him. And any other is a stranger. Any other is unauthorized. Has no right. And no place. Before him. Now see I know this sounds really. really this sounds terrible to the natural mind. It, it's an offense to the natural mind. Because immediately we go to the thought. Well, where's my part in this? Where am I in this picture? Found in him. That's it. Clothed upon with Him. He is your life unto God. Reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, alive unto God through Christ Jesus. He is your life. You're not missing or lacking anything in this. There's nothing that you're lacking, nothing that you're missing except the comprehension of the One. Who is made unto you all things. And in the ignorance of that one. In the ignorance of the sufficiency of the seed who lives in you. You and I still will desire our place. And our part. That is why the continual working of the cross has to continually be made known and wrought and working in our hearts there has to be the continuation of this
stranger is defined as not of the seed. Unauthorized is defined as not the seed. And we have already read these verses, but now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. If ye be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And I will also take of them, this is Isaiah 66, 21 through 22. I will also take of them for priests and for Levites, saith the Lord, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain. Now listen to these words. As the new heaven and the new earth that I will make, as long as they shall remain before me in my sight, so shall the seed and your name remain. Why? Because the name and the seed are one and the same. The new heaven and the new earth itself is embodied in this seed. In this one who is standing in the sight of God. Who stands and remains before him. Isaiah 65, 16 through 17. Because he who is blessed in... Now listen to this. I, 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 I'm looking at these verses. I'm still looking at them. He who is blessed in the earth will be blessed by the God of truth. He who swears in the earth will swear by the God of truth. Because the former things are forgotten and because they are hidden from my sight. God said, all the former things are hidden from my sight. I no longer behold that. But look at the next verse. Here's the sight of God. Here's the thing that occupies his view. Here's the thing. For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth. And the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. As if they never existed. Now, so the way I'm seeing this at this present time is, because of that, in view of that, when we enjoy the realities of this new reality created of God in Christ Jesus, those who have blessed themselves in the earth will now bless themselves in the God of truth. Those who have blessed themselves in the earth will now bless themselves in the God of truth. And in the Hebrew, that word God of truth is interesting. It's Elohim Amen, which means the God who is the Amen. The God who is the Amen. How in one time we blessed ourselves and thought there were blessings in the earth. Now we find all blessings in the God who is the Amen. And most commentaries will go to that and they'll talk about how all the promises are yea and amen in Christ and that he himself is called in Revelation the amen of God. It all has to do with this. It's, it's, it's the new heaven and the new earth that is defined in one man. The new heaven and the new earth that is embodied in one seed. Here's, here's what I want to look at. Look at the, 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 the verse here. To be a memorial, this is verse 40 of chapter 16. To be a memorial unto the children of Israel, that no stranger, which is not of the seed of Aaron, come near to offer incense before the Lord. I began to look at these verses, and I, I began to consider, think about, what it means to be near to God. Closer to God. All of my Christian life, and most of my Christian life, that was my desire. I want to be closer to God. I, I want to get nearer to God. And so religion was ready to tell me how. To give me instructions on how to make that happen. On how to bring that about so that I would finally be, or at least feel as if, I was nearer to God and closer to God. Nearer my God to thee, all of the songs that we sing. Just a closer walk with thee. But let me, let me at least present something to you that may offend some of you, but let me present something to you because... In chapter 17, you're going to be offended again <laughs> if you're offended at this. 
Because everything in, in this view that God is making known in these verses in the person of his son in my heart is just consolidating everything into one man. Everything consolidated, even what it means to be near and close to God. I used to think that was determined by me and how well I performed. But it's not. Let me, let me read some verses. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. What's the new and living way? The newness of life. Him living in us, being our only life, which he's consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, that we may, Become dead to the first and have the second, the living one, the Lord himself from heaven, the resurrection and the life now living in us as our only life unto God. And having such a high priest, going to the high priest here, over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, full assurance of faith. Faith, seeing him, knowing him comprehending all spiritual reality as who he is. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. A long time ago I did a class on that, about the conscience and what it meant to have an evil or a good conscience. And the word conscience is made up of two words in the Greek and in, and in English. But it's, it's con, which means to be joined to or united to, and the word science, which means knowledge. So it, your conscience is determined by what your knowledge or your understanding is joined to. What is your knowledge joined to? Is it joined to him or is it joined to you? Is everything of God, everything of spiritual reality, is it known in his face or is it known in yours? If it's known in your face, that's what Hebrews here calls an evil conscience. And we are to have our hearts sprinkled. It's a work in the heart. It's God working in the heart, baptizing us, if you will. Go to, go to 1 Peter. It talks about the great baptism, and he uses the type of Noah. And he comes out of that, out of that type of Noah, and he says it is a baptism, but it's not washing away of the filth of the flesh. That's what we mostly think about. What am I doing? How am I doing? But it's the answer of a good conscience by the resurrection. What's that mean? It's my conscience now being purified because the knowledge that I possess, the knowledge of spiritual reality, that knowledge is joined to him. Why? Because it is God's knowledge being revealed in me of the one who remains, the resurrection himself, the one who lives. One creation being totally wiped away, baptized, circumcised, and one remaining. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 12 through 22. For the priesthood, this is the American Standard Version, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are said belongeth to another tribe, from which no man hath given attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord has sprung out of Judah, as to which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priests. And what we say is yet more abundantly evident. If after the likeness of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest, who hath been made not after the law of carnal commandments, but after the power of an endless life. For it is witnessed of him, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is a disannulling of the foregoing commandment because of its weakness and its unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect, 
The word is teleos there. Perfect is teleos, which means to be brought to the goal. Thayer's also says it is to bring in what is yet lacking in order to render a thing full and complete. It could not bring in that which would make it full and complete. The law could not bring that about. But a bringing in thereupon of a better hope through which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as it is not without the taking of an oath, for they indeed have been made priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him that saith of him, the Lord swear and will not repent himself, thou art a priest forever. By so much also hath Jesus become the surety or the guarantee of the better covenant. By which we draw nigh unto God. The bringing in of a better hope through which we draw nigh unto God. The word uh, to, to bring in there means to introduce something Aside from what has already been. In the Strong's it would say a super introduction. It means to introduce something that is superior to that which is already or has already been. Basically Christ coming, the bringing in of the better hope. That better hope is not another hope of something yet to be. It is the fullness of the hope that was given to Israel. It is the fullness of the thing they expected and hoped for, Christ in you, as he says in Colossians 1. And it is the bringing in of that better hope by which we draw nigh unto God. See, Kenneth Wiest talks about this and and he, he says that, you know, the first covenant could not appropriate this and what, what I think he means is that it didn't allow all men to come near to God. But now all men can. That's not what he's saying. It's not what he's saying. It's important to realize that this drawing near unto God is by reason of the bringing in of the person of the hope himself. The object hoped for. Now follow me, I know this will get wordy, but the goal hoped for the seed himself. It is not about many people being drawn nigh unto God or having access to that, but our nearness to God being affected in the person of the hope himself. What I mean is, our nearness to God is already a done deal. It's already done in Him, as Him. Because even in the even in the Greek, this word is draw nigh here in Hebrews. Even in the Greek, it is in the present active tense. It is not something we work toward. It is not something we get to at some point in time. It is something done, accomplished in himself. Why? Because as we see in number 16, he is the one God permits to come near. He is the one that God permits to come near and stand in his sight. My point in all of this is very simple. Yet it determines the nature of our relation to God. In this I am attempted to consider these questions. What does it actually mean to be close or to be near to God? What does it mean when we say we desire to be closer or to be nearer to God? And does what we mean totally violate the order that we see addressed in the testimony? See, getting this wrong, misunderstanding this, lends itself to an approach that will result in a nearness that is merely an illusion. 
because it will be determined by me, my works, my actions, how good I am, how good I do. As we see in number 16 and forward, the seed himself determines our nearness to God. All attempts to get closer, to approach, to be near in any realization or understanding other than not I but Him is equivalent to our carrying our own censer before God attempting to get His recognition. It is a violation of the grace of God. It is a violation of this better hope that has come in the seed who is our life. It is me wanting to have his place. Me trying to have a relationship that only he has and only he is in me. And you take this back to what we read at the beginning of this class. One son in us crying, Abba, Father. Bringing into our souls his approach unto God. His relationship unto God. That is what it truly means for us to be near or close to God. And I hope you can hear this without turning me off immediately or, or, or getting offended. But our nearness to God is not determined. It is not lessened or enhanced through anything we do. It is determined and perfectly settled in who He is. And as who He is within us. Just as we see here. And I know this flies in the face of our just a closer walk with the theology. But, the clo- but, but getting closer to Him was never the intent of our walk. Not the, not the intention of God of walking in the Spirit. It was ne- that was never the intention of getting closer to God. We are to walk in the light of the one who is our closeness and nearness with God. The one who is the sweet perfume delighting the Father. See, nearness to God is the seed whose right it is to be near. That's the grace of God by which we are born again of that incorruptible seed. And anything else is a violation. Anything else is a perversion. Anything else is me attempting to bring my pollution before him. The seed determines our nearness to God. Meaning he is our only approach unto God. This is why in the testimony, everything of their approach to God, everything of the offerings had to be brought to Him. It was never theirs. It was never about them. It was about Him and His relationship unto God being their relationship unto God. They had no approach but Him. No closeness, no nearness but Him. That's that's what it means to be accepted in the beloved. And I know that that and then the next thing you see here in these in this picture is them murmuring against after Korah and the company of others are, are destroyed, then the congregation rises up again against Moses and Aaron and and uh Let's see, let me get to the verse here. Saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. Came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron. They looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation and the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of of the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, get you up from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell before their faces. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer, put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation, make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague 
was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And listen to this verse. This is another picture. This is what God, this is the, uh, again, God displaying the reality of the seed. The judgment of this grace. He's displaying it again. And he stood between the dead and the living. And the plague was stayed. You see that? He stood now as the dividing line between the living and the dead. I'm not going to stay on that at all really, but that's, that's a reality that continually must be revealed in the heart and made known in the heart. He's the dividing line between the first and the second. He is the, he is the great judgment and, and division between flesh and spirit. What is living and what is dead. I mean, he, he's the dividing line. All right, let's go to number 17. I, I want to go ahead and get there. I don't want to not get there in this class. I... Uh, I'm going to read just the first part of this I'm going to read the whole chapter but I'm going to stop in certain areas here and, and, and uh, comment Jehovah this is from the Young's Literal Translation well let me read it in the King James there's a part of this that I really like in the uh, Young's Literal and the Lord spake unto Moses saying speak unto the children of Israel Take every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers. All their princes according to the house of their fathers. Twelve rods. And write thou every man's name upon his rod. And thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi. For one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. And thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom. And I will make, a, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel whereby they murmur against you. Now, let me just stop there and, 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 and look at this because here we have these rods and the actual in the Hebrew is branch. It's a branch. They make it a rod. It's like a rod that some say they have distinguishing marks to, to distinguish between the tribes. Each head of the tribe had, had one and, and all of that. But I want to look at it because the rod and the branch is the branch that we're talking about. And, and, in, and in this, in Aaron's uh, case, it was an almond branch. But it was a branch. And there's so many verses about the branch that would come. A rod that's come out of the stock of Jesse and a branch from his roots is fruitful. It says in, in Isaiah 10 or 11, 1 through 10, it says, A rod hath come out, this is Young's literal, A rod hath come out from the stock of Jesse, and a branch from his roots is fruitful. Listen to that. I want you to hear that because that's important here. The branch that is from his roots is fruitful. Resting on him hath the spirit of Jehovah, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of Jehovah, to refresh him in the fear of Jehovah. And by the spirit of his eyes he judgeth not, or by the sight, not spirit, sight of his eyes he judgeth not, nor by the hearing of his ears decideth. And he hath judged in righteousness the poor, decided in uprightness for the humble of the earth, and hath smitten earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he putteth the wicked to death, 
and righteousness has been the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. And a wolf has sojourned with a lamb, and a leopard with a kid doth lie down. See, everybody puts this off in the future. No, this is about the person himself, the coming of the branch. Either he's come or he hasn't. This is about the branch coming. A calf and a young lion and fatling are together and, he, and a little youth is leader over them and cow and, and, and bear do feed together, lie down. Their young ones and a lion as an ox eateth straw and played hath a suckling by the hole of an asp and on the den of a cockatrice hath the weaned one put his hand. Evil they do not, nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for full hath been the earth with the knowledge of Jehovah. As the waters are covering the sea, and there hath been in that day, see that's the day, a root of Jesse that is standing for an ensign of the people. Remember how we took this whole congregation of Israel and we embodied the entirety of the congregation because of all the ensign and the standard that was around the tabernacle. And we embodied them in the person of the high priest because they all corresponded to the breastplate. This is about one man in the midst of Israel, the ensign, and unto him the nation seek, and his rest shall be honor, it says in Young Literal, but glory in other translations. But this is the branch. This is the branch. And I'm looking at it in light of this branch. With what's going to happen, we need to keep these things, these verses in mind. I'm not going to read it, but Jeremiah 33, 14 through 26, you need to read that. And it, it's because it talks about how it is impossible for him to break his covenant basically with the branch. That will grow up unto David. And that there will never be a lack of one sitting upon the throne or a priest to minister unto him. Why? Because the priest and the king is the one branch. Is the rod that shall shoot forth from Jesse. Jesse. I wrote here the perpetualness, and read those verses that I said, I'm not going to read them, but the perpetualness of having a son on the throne and a priest to minister unto the Lord is fulfilled in this branch. It is sure by a covenant that cannot be broken. The root meaning of the word perpetual, I was looking at this, is uninterrupted, and I like that. Continual, uninterrupted, meaning that you, me, good, bad, nothing can interrupt this. Nothing can interrupt this. So let's get back to it. There's other verses, but let's get back to this. And thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi. For one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. I want to reiterate, I want to just stress that what's happening here is God further demonstration or demonstrating and proving the supremacy of one seed to stand before him. Proving in the sight of all the people the sufficiency and the supremacy of the chosen one. He says it this way. It's in the Young's Literal. It's, he says it this way. The man whose rod on whom I fix doth flourish. Now, I like that translation. It's not just I choose it or I, or, or I accept it. Even the word choose actually means excellent or that it's more excellent. But the word fix, I like that. On whom I fix, the rod on whom I fix, I, 
I guess you could say, on whom my gaze is fixed. This, this perfectly states what we've said many times in this class with regard to the fixed perspective, unmovable gaze of the Father upon the one chosen, who is the knowing of God with regard to the whole. The root of this word in the Hebrew actually is to look keenly upon. Keenly meaning with a distinguishing manner. In a distinguishing manner. Meaning basically that that God's gaze of this one judges. It is a judgment that gazes upon one and beholds nothing but. It is a dividing line. Judging between the one and everything else. And he says, in this, in the blooming of this one I have chosen, I will cause to cease from me their murmurings. So I looked the word to cease, and it was interesting to me, it didn't just mean to stop. You read the word cease and you think it just means for them to hush and and, and stop doing, but that's not what it means. In the Hebrew, according to the, this is the pulpit commentary. In the Hebrew, it actually means, I will cause it to sink so that they shall not rise again. Now that's important when we look at the end of this chapter. And the realization that comes into the midst of Israel in the seeing of this one rod that buds. I've said many times that the seeing of him, the seeing of this one, brings an end to all complaint, all murmuring, all grumblings. But see, it wasn't just him trying to stop them from grumbling about things or complaining. This was a judgment he was to bring into their heart concerning the grace, the cross. The reality of their relationship, the singleness of their standing before him. And standing with him. It is him showing them. His view. It is the simplicity of his. View. Being revealed. And by such revealing the relationship that he had provided. We see here the cross in its most perfect sense. Made effectual in the seeing of the one. Who bears fruit unto God. Fruit that glorifies the Father. Let me, let me read these verses. This is, this is uh, again, in the Young's Literal. It came to pass. Now this is, again, the Young's Literal. It hath come to pass that the man's rod on whom I fix doth flourish. And I have caused to cease from off of me the murmuring of the sons of Israel, which they are murmuring against you. And Moses speaketh unto the sons of Israel and all their princes. Give unto him one rod for a prince, one rod for a prince for their father's house. Twelve rods. And the rod of Aaron is in the midst of their rods. And Moses placed the rods before Jehovah in the tent of of the testimony. And it comes to pass on the on the morrow that Moses goeth in unto the tent of the testimony, and lo, or behold, this is he beheld, the rod of Aaron hath flourished for the house of Levi. And it bringeth out flourishings, and doth blossom, blossoms, and doth produce almonds. And Moses bringeth out all of the rods from before Jehovah unto all the sons of Israel and they look, they see it and they take each his rod and Jehovah saith unto Moses put back or return to its place is some uh, is a more literal translation return that rod before the testimony bring it back into the holy of holies some, some there's debate whether it was put in front of the ark Uh, or inside the ark in front of the uh, tablets of the testimony. But we do know that it it was in the ark as well. And, And that's a beautiful thing. Return the rod back 
to the Holy of Holies, back before the Ark of the Testimony. And this is the return of the fruitful branch unto the Father. This is his return unto the Father, fruitful and full. Not void, not returning void, but in full harvest and fruitfulness. This is not about many, this is about the one. Do you understand? This is... This is what we're trying to see in this. This is what God is continually making known in the midst of the congregation. He's showing the sufficiency of the one by showing that this one is the full harvest. That he bears the fruit that glorifies him. You want to bear fruit? Stop. <laughs> cease our, I mean we need to cease our vain attempts. To bear fruit, we must, we must abide and live in the God-wrought acknowledgement of the one fruitful branch who is in us. Who is our life unto the Father. But look at these, I'm out of time here, but let me, let me get through this and I'll stop here. Moses brings out the rods from before Jehovah unto all the sons of Israel, and they look, or they see... And they take each one his rod. Now, now this, is a, this is a picture. that there, There's a couple of things here that, that I, 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 it struck me. Flies in the face of most of the things that I believed all my Christian life. And have believed up to very recently to some degree. So let me read this. I wrote these things down. Contrary to the concept of life in Christ... That most people have. And the assumed meaning of union with Christ. That is promulgated in, in religion. Aaron's rod. The branch. Did not cause the other rods. To blossom. Too. Just because they were in close vicinity with him. It didn't make them bloom. Only one rod blossomed. And the others had to understand that their rod did not yield the same result and was therefore not recognized by God with the same significance. Now, follow me. The rod did not branch out and wind itself around all of the other rods. It didn't intertwine itself with the others for an absolute unbreakable uniting with them. This is our idea of union. I'm tangled up with Jesus. Entwined, mingled together with Jesus. True union is being described here. One buds. One blossoms. And one bears fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is not me and you Bearing fruit pleasing to God. It is the one who is in you and me. Being the fruit that God himself in which the Father is glorified. You see that? There's a difference in that. One leaves me in the picture. The other is Christ all and in all. And the only thing that makes the dividing line between something that just sounds like semantics is the seeing of this one seed. But seeing him as the full, blossoming, fruitful branch who alone has right to stand in the sight of God for us. One blossoms. One bears fruit and all being known and identified in God in that living, awakened, fruitful one. It is the single stalk weighed before God in which the whole harvest is seen and known by God. Uh, I, I wrote here awakened. He's awakened because that's actually in the Hebrew what the word almond means. Awakened. It's a picture. And in, even in nature, the almond tree is the first tree, the first, the earliest known tree to bloom. It blooms before any other tree ever blooms. It's the first to bloom. This is the almond tree. 
Why? The first fruit. He is the first. You understand? It's not... That's why He is the firstborn in many brethren. Their murmuring ceased because they see one living branch who has been awakened the first fruit of a new creation and they see in that light and hold in their hand proof that none lives and thus none is chosen or fixed upon of God but that one I want you to under, I want you to think of this picture this is this is huge here just visualize this picture they see this one rod blossoming blooming and bearing almonds who is bringing forth an abundant harvest in the sight of God. And then, they're holding in their hand. I entitled this section, The Name Above All Names. Remember, they wrote their name on the rod. And they had to take into their hands these dead sticks with their name written on it. And in Moses or Aaron's hand, there was this living, fruitful vine with his name on it. You see that? They see the one whose name is above every name. They see the sufficiency of the one. In their hands there are these dead sticks with their names on it. Identifying that all but one lives in the sight of God. All but one bears fruit acceptable unto the Father. Exalting one name above all other names. Proving in their sight one seed, one name has right in his sight. So then in that understanding, this is what they say. <laughs> Lo, we have expected, this is Young Literal. In the, in the King James it doesn't come out this way, but in the Young's Literal it does, it's beautiful. Lo, we have expired, we have perished, we have all of us perished. Any who is at all drawing near unto the tabernacle dies have we not been consumed to expire you hear that this is a reckoning a judgment in their hearts this isn't about being dead in sin no this is about what it means to truly be crucified with Christ yet life is there there is a living one there is a living reality but it is not I it is Christ that liveth in me. Remember we've always said it. That when he says yet I live. The word I is actually not there. What he's saying is. I am crucified with Christ. But life is still present. There is life. But it's not me. That life is not me. It is Christ who liveth in me. This is what they're seeing. We're all perished. We're all dead. We have one life unto God. And it is this living branch. This living, fruitful rod who remains in the sight of God in the, in the holiest for us. Most commentaries miss the point. I mean, they say that God was trying to scare these people. Bring fear into their hearts so that they had never even attempt to do this again or question the right of Aaron to have this office. And I understand why, because scare tactics are always used in religion. I was scared to death the first few years of my religious experience. That was what motivated me, fear. Well, not the reverential fear of God, but just scared. But this is not what God did. He's not using scare tactics here. These men in the sight of this living branch are actually declaring the truth, having seen the truth. They're stating the truth of their state of being with regard to their standing with God in the congregation of Israel. As the congregation of Israel. 
This is the acknowledgement that comes, the judgment that comes in the seeing of one living fruitful branch. These words are in perfect tense, seen as a done deal in the eyes of God and of these men now. Knowing that their only way to draw near is not I, but Aaron. If we are to draw near, it is in the comprehension that we have no life, no relationship, no offering unto God, but this one seed and living branch that stands in the sight of God for us. This rod was now returned before the testimony. This is the perfect knowing of God revealed and is the recognition that governs the soul that is knowing even as it is known of God. I have no life before you but this one. Father, reveal this one in me. Do not allow me to live in opposition, in contradiction, but let me live in the light of the sufficiency of the one that you have chosen and who alone has right to stand before you as my life, as my relationship. Because anything other than that, anything, any understanding that I come in which I come, other than that, any other understanding is, is anathema. Any other understanding than not I, but Aaron, not I, but Christ, not I, but one seed, the seed who is in me, the seed who is my life, but not I, but him. Anything other than that is a violation of this grace God has given May the Father continue to reveal that one living branch, that one fruitful branch in our hearts, that he may be glorified in that one. Amen. Well, we'll stop there. We'll uh, end this class. And uh, let me let me just... Uh, the state before I go off the air is we have put some other that we've put lodging information for the summer conference there's lodging information now that's available but we've also put another so if you went earlier and saw lodging information there about the summer conference there are other places now that are available that we found Judith Brown found some other places in the area uh, there's some cabins and then there's a couple of houses that are for rent in the area for that week. And uh, so if you're interested in that, we have the phone numbers. We have actually we have pictures of the place on the second one uh, and what they cost per night. So if you want to uh, look into that and you're interested, go on the website. John Casera should have it up uh, by tonight uh, at the at the latest, I'd say. So. That's just a reminder, just to let you know there are other places available. So, all right, we'll stop there. Thanks for being with us. Amen.